everybody. Welcome back to the Brittany Rossi show. And for the first time in the history of the show, we have <laughs> not a lady guest. We have a guy with us today, but I just really connected well with him recently at a conference and felt like he had a lot to offer our audience and our community here. So I'm so honored to introduce Nathan Holritz. And he's an entrepreneur based in Chattanooga, Tennessee. He's the father of two children, Austin and Addison. And he's also the founder and owner of something called Photographer's Edit, um, which is photographersedit.com. And he's also the host of a podcast himself called the Boca Photography Podcast. And you can also find that at bocapodcast.com. Um, in his free time, he really just enjoys spending time with his kids and his family and friends, which is something that I think all of us at entrepreneur, as entrepreneurs, we want more of that in our life. We want more time with our family and our friends. And he also enjoys reading and playing uh, soccer and riding motorcycles which is really, really fun. So I don't want to be the one speaking the whole time. Nathan, will you tell us in your own words in about two sentences, a little bit about yourself and your business? Uh, wow. Yeah. Two sentences, right? <laughs> I, see, I'm already, I've already said multiple sentences. This is my, my weakness as I talk too much. Um, <laughs> two things about myself. What you mentioned motorcycles. Yes. I, I just started riding motorcycles in the last three years and, okay. um, have since owned six or seven different motorcycles. So I've, I've got a little obsessive with it. Uh, okay. To be clear, not all at once. I tend to trade them in and out. But it was something to do to push myself outside my comfort zone, do something that was a little bit, um, well, certainly actually extremely challenging physically, mentally, and kind of challenge some fears as well. So I, I've been riding, spending some time on the racetrack with motorcycle, and that's been a whole learning curve in and of itself and really, really exciting. So um, that's something kind of random about me. My yeah. business, you mentioned Photographer's Edit, is an editing company. We have been in business now for 11 years and we've been working with professional photographers primarily in the US, uh, also those in Canada, Europe, Australia, and we provide custom editing services. So we match the photographer's editing style so that they don't have to sit behind the computer for hours and hours and hours on end processing their own images. So we offer editing services. What we're really doing is giving them time that they can spend continuing to develop their business or watching Netflix if they want to, or ideally spending time with the important people in their life. And I, I think that's so brilliant. It's so brilliant. Why? So I'm assuming because you have a, a strong value for, for family and friends, tell me, is that part of why you started your business? Very much so. So I was a wedding photographer myself for about a decade. Okay. And during that time, being a bit OCD myself, the idea of sitting in front of the computer editing images was just kind of a nightmare for me. And so there were two or three other solutions in the industry at, at the time, and they were particularly expensive and complicated. So I saw an opportunity to not only create a solution that I needed, but to do so and position myself against those other companies by offering a service that was less expensive, so more attainable for many more photographers in the industry, and that also was much simpler to interact with, to engage with. And so this was back in 2008 when we launched. But what that then enabled me to do was not only continue to pursue my entrepreneurial interests and an opportunity in the industry, but also then to free up more time so that I could spend that time with my family, uh, in particular my, my two kids, as you mentioned, Austin and Addison. I love that. And it, it snowballs beautifully, right? Like the, the more you have like systems in place and, and you get more time back, like it just, it creates more space for more ideas and like doing things better and more efficiently. And so um, I, I want to highlight too um, that you built this business and even the brand a little bit. I was looking at your website and you talk a lot about time, mm. right? Um, it's really important that we build our businesses on our personal values and our value system. And if we aren't careful, it's very easy to build our lives around a business mm. instead of a business around our lives. And so you've already mentioned time as a value and that's emerging very quickly as a value of yours, but are there other brand values um, that you feel like you built your business on? Minimalism or simplicity. Okay. Uh, and that might be a little bit confusing for somebody who goes to our website now and they see that we offer a variety of services. When you go to check out, there are many options. Um, what that simplicity or minimalism has looked like over the years has changed. But 
I don't, for me, I'm, I'm not a great multitasker. And so I don't like a lot of moving parts in my life if, if I don't have to. And that carries over into business and ultimately the experience that I want to give my clients as well. So I mentioned when we launched the, our competition at the time, the, the services or the, their business model were ultimately very complicated, um, the, our primary competitor in particular. And so I wanted to create a simpler offering. We did that initially with just very simple packages. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we had three, two or three different options and you could choose and you knew immediately what it cost and it didn't take 15 minutes to scroll through a PDF and try to figure out what that service actually meant. Um, so that's how we started. What we realized then was that photographers like options and despite the fact that we said we didn't offer them, they would still ask for them. And so what that then morphed into was adding more options, but then trying to figure out how to minimize the number of moving parts as we offer more options. So mm. simplicity can look different ways. Instead of simply offering you know, one or two services, one or two packages, and very few options in the shopping cart, we've expanded on those, but we make it as easy as possible to take advantage of the service. Uh, so what that means is more complication on the back end and developing the systems that you were alluding to. Mm -hmm. But what that means for the client then is, is it's much simpler to use a custom service, which might innately be complicated. We try to simplify that. And I think t there's two things I want to kind of amplify from even what you just said there. One is that you said there was already like a presence for this service in the marketplace and you still went after it. Mm -hmm. And so one, I, I want to just remind people that even if there's somebody out there already doing something, you might have a different take on it and it's exa exactly what people need. So one, don't feel intimidated by the fact that there might be a little bit of competition out there. And if there is, be aware of it and it's going to make you better, right? We can't do better unless someone's pushing us to be better and do better. And two, just because something is simple doesn't necessarily mean that it's easy, right? Mm -hmm. There's a big difference between yeah. simple and easy and to pursue simplicity, it actually requires uh, quite a bit of work on, on maybe the front end or the back end mm -hmm. um, so that our clients have a, a beautiful experience that they rave about to other people. And so um, one of the things that I have started implementing a little bit more of, which is why I invited Nathan to come share with us today is something called workflows. And this is something that if you are a photographer, brand photographer, wedding photographer, um, you're very aware of um, in your industry, but this is important for all business owners. So um, can you, first of all, tell us a little bit more about what a workflow is and how this can help us simplify our lives and processes with our clients? Yeah, absolutely. Workflow on just a very simple level is a systematic way to approach doing something. Okay. So Rather than, you know, I have, let's just take the editing example. Uh, if, if I'm going to go edit some images or uh, maybe, maybe even something at a more personal practical level, I'm going to go vacuum the house, right? Yes. What is, I can just kind of randomly go this direction and then that direction and go to this room and then unplug the vacuum cleaner and go to a different room and then come back to this room again. It's going to get done in the end, but that, Going about it in that way is going to mean much less efficiency. It takes way more time. Maybe I end up leaving, I'm missing some spots in the process. Uh, whereas if, again, on a very simple level, I actually take it room by room and, and I have a certain way within each of those rooms of vacuuming to make sure that I get every single spot, that is an example, and again, a very simplistic example, but an example of a more systematic way to go about doing that thing, in this case, the vacuuming. So the goal here is to minimize the kind of haphazard approach to doing something so that we can work much more efficiently. Yes. And so I like that you broke it down so simplistically for people. And as you were talking, I was totally hit with the memory of probably like something that was ingrained in me from the time I was very little. Yeah. Uh, there is a way to clean the house from top to bottom, right? Okay. We dust and then the dust falls into the carpet and then you vacuum, right? Or like we do things in a certain order with the laundry. Um, and the, those are really simple ways of workflows. And you know, you might still get the laundry done and folded, but there's more efficient ways of doing things, of, of maybe batching your, your work or um, you know, order, order matters so that things feel like you're not going back and doing the same task twice. 
Um, so that, that's a really practical and way that I think everyone will relate to workflows. What are some practical workflows in business? And maybe this would be for people who aren't in the photography business. What are some general workflows that we might encounter? Wow. And, and there are so many, as you point out, I mean, as entrepreneurs, and it depends on what field you're in and um, the way that it, what your business model looks like, how you're going about providing a service and, and then whether or not you have employees, if you're running the business solely on your own, or you've got other people to be able to delegate to. So there are so many potential workflows. The, the one that honestly, well, there are a couple that come to mind immediately. One is a workflow for managing business finances. And this is one, and, and, Part of the reason I can speak about this is because it was a significant weakness of mine for quite some time. Uh, and a lot of it had to do with just very simply the fact that I didn't have a workflow in place at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I, was, I was brought up in a family that didn't have a lot of money. And my parents, my dad in particular, did attempt to teach me some basic principles about managing money. But ultimately, money, I, I had a sense of fear about money or apprehension about money, nervousness, the stress associated with the idea of money, especially um, in my 20s when I was barely making any money, um, you know, the idea of paying bills and then starting a business and now, now trying to pay bills with the money that I'm making and then also trying to pay taxes on top of that and doing so on time. And, and it just became a source of stress, largely because I built it up in my head. But part of the, the really the biggest problem, one of the biggest problems there is that I didn't have a system in place for proactively managing my finances on a regular basis so that not only was I aware of the numbers for my business, but then also I was prepared for submitting quarterly taxes. Um, in, in Tennessee, where I live, submitting state sales tax and, um, and then paying my year-end taxes. A lot, all of that stuff really is actually relatively simple, especially if you've got a good account to work with, if you've got a good workflow in place to begin with. And fortunately, these days with the technology that we have, it's actually even easier than ever um, to do just that. So that would be the first workflow that comes to mind, largely because it's so important. If we're going to run a sustainable business and actually make a half decent living, we have to be mm -hmm. proactive about managing our finances. The other thing that um, I think takes way too much time for way too many business owners is communication, managing communication. Mm -hmm. um, and there are various reasons for that. We can kind of dig into that, that the topic of managing communication more effectively. But again, there is a tendency for business owners to react rather than proactively establish a communication workflow. And so they're just, they're reacting to whatever. And of course, now we have more communication than ever, Facebook and Instagram and text messages and Snapchat and, and everything, right? And not only that, most people leave um, those apps open or notifications open or enabled. And so they're constantly distracted from whatever it is that they're doing because of the incoming communication. And that can be an absolute nightmare for the sake of efficiency. So communication management, that there's a workflow associated or can be a workflow associated with that, which can save a significant amount of time. I love that because there's communication coming at us from every direction. I love this idea of funneling it or controlling it or managing it. And even if it's an action as small as turning the notification off on your phone. So it's not there putting pressure on you to respond. Mm -hmm. um, or even maybe having an auto responder saying like, Hey, I don't respond to things in this particular channel. Please reach out at this other channel. Um, those are great ways to kind of build a, a flow of energy or communication or money, right? Like, and you're right, there's so many tools at our disposal to help us corral the cats that are running around wild all over the place, <laughs> right? Like we need to yeah. bring a whole bunch of kittens, get them in one place and hope they stay there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really funny. And I think that that's really good. Um, well, another one that comes to mind for me is um, client onboarding mm. uh, workflows. And I think you might be able to speak to this a little bit too. Um, are there some things that we should keep top of mind, especially for a service-based provider, not just providing products, um, that you would say are really important in a client onboarding flow so that they have a really positive experience and you have a positive experience too? Yeah, I, and, and again, there's, it's going to depend on the business model and, and um, the type of service being offered and, and ultimately what your goal is in that onboarding process. 
I would say something that's made a significant difference in our business is when somebody creates an account at Photographer's Edit and all the interactions happen, of course we have a website, so nobody's going to a physical location to, to purchase our services. They're going to a website and we're made aware of an account being created, potentially a first purchase being made. But we have somebody who focus, who is focused on proactive outreach to that potential client or that brand new client for the sake of beginning a more personal relationship with them. Now we're a relatively large company and yet we don't keep that from an allowing us to be able to create a more personal experience for these clients. Now I realize that, that the idea of a more personal experience or developing personal relationships, this is certainly not a new concept is very popular to talk about and to even potentially implement in a, a an onboarding workflow, a client management workflow. But again, the, the very specific action of picking up a phone call or picking up a phone and making a call or sending an email to somebody and saying, hey, we just saw you created an account and wanted to make sure you didn't have any further questions. Here's some resources for you. And this is not an automated process. We have automated emails that will go to somebody that's created an account, kind of a welcome email. But this is an individual person taking the time to reach out uh, via phone, via email, if they're not able to create it uh, or have a phone conversation, and making sure that there's a personal touch. And um, in an industry where, or particularly the service within our industry, where that isn't necessarily commonplace, that enables us to stand out. And what we're also noticing is that while we're not creating or we don't have the, the same number of accounts being created on our site that we used to, the conversion to paying clients um, mm. and, and regular clients is better than what it used to be in some way. So that, that has been really fascinating to see and, and it can't help but at least give some of the credit for that to the fact that we're making this proactive effort and outreach when they create a new account. And two, something that I'm hearing you say kind of underneath the words is that, you know, workflows are great in a lot of areas of our businesses, but one thing that you should not try to workflow or even automate is relationships and human touch. And I see a huge resurgence in, um, because I feel like automation was like a really big thing, like automate your social media, auto automate a work, um, a webinar or automate a funnel, no. but don't automate the relationships, even if it feels like it takes a little bit more time. What I hear you saying is that it actually increases the conversion of clients who want to come in and do work with you. Would you say that that, would you agree with that? Very much so. I mean, you want to make sure that you're, you're, you've created brand awareness that kind of filters out clients that aren't relevant to your brand in any way. That's something else that we've been doing in the onboarding process, but then yes, that proactive outreach, somebody's like, oh, even if, it, even if they just get a voicemail, they didn't pick up and they actually have a conversation with Tiffany, who is, who is kind of leading this, this effort. Um, even if they don't have a conversation with Tiffany, they've, they've heard her voice, somebody's actually taken the time to reach out to them. So like you said, it's not just about automation. We have to, for the sake of scalability, we do implement some automation. But at the end of the day, you can't, people are way too intuitive to, to not notice that that email that you just got was copy and pasted with, you know, with their name attached to it, basically. Um, and, and that is ultimately going to hurt the brand impression. So yeah, you, you really can't substitute automation for, or actual contact for automation. And so as we continue to build on this conversation of workflows, um, our listeners might hear us using language like automation. Um, I think maybe we would even have said outsourcing already of like, we need to outsource this piece or automate this piece. Um, can you kind of help us understand what automation means, what outsourcing means to someone who's relatively new to, to business and is still doing everything themselves and they're wearing all the hats? Um, what does that mean and what does that practically look like? Yeah, so a couple of practical examples. First of all, when it comes to automation, I mean, there are one of the cool things about living in 2019 is that you could likely Google search anything that you spend your time doing, and you can either find a piece of software, whether web based or computer based or phone based, uh, or a third party service that will do that thing for you. Right. And I mean, literally, and this is what I've recommended to photographers. If, if you look at how you spend your time in the day and take that list and, and 
kind of break it up into two segments, proactive versus reactive. So those things that it's more important you're involved in that will actually translate to increasing your bottom line. Those are the proactive tasks, but the reactive tasks, these are things that have to be done in order for your business to exist, but don't necessarily require your involvement, not necessarily associated directly with increasing your bottom line. Google that list of reactive tasks that you do in a day, and you can literally find a third party service that will probably do that for you and or find a piece of software that will help automate that for you. Now, again, a very simple practical level, I use uh, a piece of web-based software called Calendly. It's C-A-L-E-N-D-L-Y. And Calendly enables me to minimize the amount of back and forth necessary to schedule an appointment. Now, I, I use this to schedule podcast interviews, I use this to schedule a phone call. Uh, somebody popped on there the other day and scheduled a coffee meeting with me locally here in the Chattanooga area. But it just minimizes the, that tedious back and forth, which, within which we waste so much time as entrepreneurs and just personally as well. Um, so that's a great example of a piece of software that doesn't take much time to set up that saves me hours and hours and hours and hours every year and, um, and only costs me, I think, maybe $10 a month. Um, right. I'm worth way, way, way more than that per hour. And so that, if, if I'm able to pay 10 bucks for a whole month and save literally hours of my time, um, I've made my money over and over and over and over again in that investment. So that's an example of automation. And again, my suggestion, because I know everybody's workflow is different, is to literally Google what you spend your time doing and you'll probably find uh, a way to automate that and, and or then delegate that. And so delegation, this idea of, of outsourcing or delegating something to somebody else so that you don't have to spend your time doing it, we have to be careful as entrepreneurs not to let our ego get in the way and assume that we are the only ones capable of doing this particular thing exactly the right way, the only way to do it, uh, because ultimately what that will do is eat up way too much of our time if we think that we have to be involved. So look for opportunities to delegate that work. Now, as an editing company owner for photographers, I know, and having been a photographer myself, I know that editing takes up the, the, the most significant amount of time and a week-to-week -week basis for a photographer. Uh, a wedding photographer shoots a wedding, they're going to spend 12 to 16 hours probably on average, and many spend quite a bit more than that processing just wedding. Multiply that out times 20, 30 weddings a year, and the literally you know, weeks worth of time that they get back as a result of outsourcing or delegating their editing work is amazing. And that's just one element of their business. So we have the opportunity as business owners to be able to, if we want to even, I mean, I, there, were, there was a time running my company where I was working as little as three or four hours in a week. Um, and I was able to do that because I had a wonderful team driving that, that company. I'd established the systems, which did take time up front, but I had established the systems and it ran for me. Um, that, that kind of thing may seem a little bit extreme, but in one form or another, it's very possible. And the idea is to work smart. Tim Ferriss uh, is an author who wrote a book called The Four Hour Work Week. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people heard that title and they're like, oh yeah, that's nice. Or maybe even just literally laughed it off because the idea of working four hours a week uh, just didn't seem feasible. And he has since said, you know, obviously the title is a ploy to kind of get people's attention, uh, or at least that was part of the thought process. But what he was actually referencing there wasn't that you need to only work four hours a week, but you need to work intelligently and, uh, and in many ways, have your business work for you. And part of the ways that you can, or one of the primary ways that you can do that is to delegate as much of that as possible. So I go back to that list of things that you do in a day, break it up, proactive, reactive, and as many of those reactive items on, on your list, if you haven't already been able to automate them with software, figure out if you can delegate that somewhere else and uh, save just tons of time. I love how you simplified that process. Take your tasks, step back from them, make a list, mm -hmm. proactive, reactive, and get rid of these ones on the reactive list, right? 100%. Just outsource them, delegate them, automate them with the software and reclaim that time back in your life where you can start thinking more about profitable actions that only you can do to help grow your business, especially if you're a personal brand. For you, photographers edit, it's not like your name, I mean, you're the owner of it, but there's, there's room for you to step back even more and put more people in place to run the machine. So I think that that's a very actionable thing that someone can do even today, set a timer, right? Sit down for about 10, 15 minutes, think about all of your tasks and start thinking about what's the first thing 
that's going to be most profitable for me to outsource or most affordable even. And what I've found is that sometimes it doesn't even have to be a business task. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we can back up and say, can I ask a family member, a friend, a cousin, a mom, right? Can you come over and help me with my laundry? Yep. And I'll pay you a couple bucks to, to help me with this. Or can you watch my little one while I'm doing this webinar call, right? Because we might be able to make a lot more on a webinar than we're paying for the babysitter. And 100%. so learning how to play with our time. And I think looking at it as playing instead of feeling all this pressure of like, oh, I gotta get my time under control. Like have fun with it. Play with things, yeah. see what works and what feels good and remove that pressure of gotta, gotta get it right, gotta get it right. But I'm also, glad that you point out too the fact that you can make money on the other side of that. So it's not just about spending money in order to save time, but the reality is as you save that time, now you have an opportunity potentially, the webinar was one example, to then make additional money. And that's one of the things photographers get caught up in the fact that delegating their editing work to photographers edit is going to cost money and they wanna keep that cash in the bank. 100% understand and can empathize with that, that feeling, but you have to think bigger picture. If you pay for that editing service and you're able to save eight, 10, 12, 16, 20 hours, or whatever the task is that you're delegating, you're able to save that time. Now you have that time to go further, build your business and make more money. I, I've used as an example many times over a photographer, a wedding photographer like I was, who got a good bit of business from one wedding coordinator. If I took a, a very conservative level, eight hours that I save editing myself by delegating it to photographer's edit or an editing service, I'm able to take that eight hours and go take a wedding coordinator out to lunch. That's a couple hours of that eight hours, right? I begin to develop a relationship, a friendship with them at the end of that two hours. And I say, hey, you know what? Um, I, I'd love the opportunity to work together, but I wanna make sure I'm adding value to this relationship I would love to be able to do some headshots for you. I'd love to be able to do some family uh, photographs for you. Would you be interested in that? Yes, okay, so another couple hours of that eight hours, I'm taking pictures for this wedding coordinator, maybe for her family as well. Um, I still have after that, so this is the beginning of a relationship, right? Mm -hmm. I saved the time, but I didn't just sit around and watch Netflix. I then took that time and I went and did something that is going to make a, a significant impact. It's the beginning of a relationship that could literally drive thousands and thousands of dollars to me. And I spent $150, $200 to outsource that editing work. I'm gonna make thousands in the back end because I began this relationship. And not only that, that was only four hours into the eight hours. I still have right. four hours left. If I do wanna still watch Netflix, I can. If I wanna take my girlfriend out on a date, I can do that or whatever it might be. But there's incredible opportunity, not just to save time, but to actually make more money. And we have to think about it that way. Yes, and I love that very specific example of how, you know, it, it, outsourcing eight hours of something, it feels very intimidating, like $200. Oh, but that could go so far with, with our grocery bill, yeah. right? Oh, 100%. It's very uncomfortable. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs hit this wall, this obstacle, this mindset of, mm -hmm. I got to hold it all. I got to hold it all. But, um, and maybe you've heard this term, but like money can be a little bit like manure, right? You spread it around and things grow <laughs> and you hoard it and it starts to stink and it doesn't uh, go as far. Yep. So, you know, spread your resources around your money and your time. Mm. And I think that we will find that our businesses grow, that we feel like we start to thrive and we don't feel the weight on our shoulders so much. And we start to have fun with our businesses because we're seeing results. We're seeing yeah. results, which is very cool. Um, so I know that you mentioned a book already, the four hour work week. Um, but I'd love to know, and we could probably talk about books all day. I'm a big book person. That's why I ask my guests what their favorite business book is, but do you have a favorite business book? One of my favorite that I've read in the last uh, year or so, year and a half has been, um, uh, building a story brand by Donald, Donald Miller. Miller. Very yeah. good. I, and the thing about business books, and you've probably found this as well, Brittany is, you know, 80% of it many times can be kind of just fluff. It's filler. Like they, they could have said it in a fraction of the amount of time and, and a number of words. The, one of the cool things about building a story brand, first of all, is that it's highly practical. But not only that, my, my memory of it was that I wasn't reading, you know, a, a paragraph that was great. And then the rest of the chapter, I just had to kind of get through. It was, it was highly practical, relevant information and consistently valuable. And when it comes to 
establishing a brand and effectively communicating the position of that brand to a potential client or a series of potential clients. I, I don't know that I've read a more valuable book. Uh, it's just absolutely amazing. So I can't recommend that enough. Very good. I'm a big fan of that book. Um, honestly, I had not read it until about two or three weeks ago. Oh. Um, and so I'd already been in the, in the branding business, but the way he frames things is just so brilliant. And you're right. There's just gold nuggets one after the other. You're like, Oh man, that's good. Oh man, that's good. Yes. Oh man. So, so glad that you recommended that book. If you've not, it's a, uh, to my listeners, if you haven't read that book, it is great. Go ahead and pick that up. And then do you have, um, a quote, inspirational quote or, maybe philosophy that you live by in your business that kind of keeps you focused and, and driving forward? Hmm. I, I'm a little bit of a nerd when it comes to this stuff. So I, what, I'll, what I'll do is kind of make it really personal. So I, I, if we have anybody watching the, the video version of our conversation here, I'm, I'm raising my arms up. I have two different tattoos, one on, on the inside of each arm. And I grew up in Japan, so the, the Japanese kanji characters are particularly uh, meaningful to me. But the, the word on my right arm is sentaku, uh, the Japanese word sentaku, which means choice. And then the word on my left arm is kakushin, which is the word uh, that means belief. And realizing the significance first uh, of our belief system, and, and this is not a, a re religious reference in any way, a belief system. I mean, I and you and I actually, Brittany, had had the opportunity to have conversation on my podcast earlier today, and, and I referenced this idea. But I'm sitting currently in a chair that I believe would hold me up. Fortunately, it does. <laughs> um, the the sad the sad reality is that sometimes we develop a belief or series of beliefs that um, are not objectively true, and they can be harmful to us. So, all that to say, understanding the significance of our belief system um, as it relates to the health of our personal life, as it relates to the health of our business is really important. And really what it comes down to is taking responsibility for the fact that we can create the life and the business that we want. It's so easy to kind of blame everybody else. And that's our kind of our cultural tendency these days. It seems if you just go through your Facebook feed, um, there is this, whether it's conscious or subconscious, this tendency that people have to kind of blame this thing or that thing. And, um, and I, I just, that is a very, um, I guess it's a belief system in and of itself that is quite inhibiting, right? To being able to live your, your best life. So understanding the significance of our beliefs and how that drives emotion, which then drives action um, is really important. But the other component of that is, is the word choice. And it plays to this idea again of realizing our responsibility to create the life that we want. We have the choice to develop the belief system that is going to enable us to create the life that we want. Um, and that those two ideas, um, if, for, if we had time to sit here for another hour or two, I could explain where that all comes from for me, but they have, they hold very significant meaning and I've realized, continue to realize um, the significance of those principles and it's applicable both for our personal life and our business life. Just to add a little bit of context to that though too, um, there's a book by Tony Robbins called reawaken the giant within mm -hmm. and um, he actually wrote a book called awaken the giant within years ago that's just like six seven hundred page book really big thing um, I, I would recommend it but if you want a little bit easier read there's a hundred page version and it's a free downloadable pdf called reawaken the giant within if you just google it you'll find it and he talks about the the significance of these principles of belief and choice um, with regards to the psychology that we develop as human beings and how that can affect the rest of our life. So you can check the, that book out for more context. Absolutely. And we will be sure to link um, the, all the books that we've mentioned so far in this podcast, um, as well as um, that one that you just mentioned by Tony Robbins in the show notes here. Um, so thank you for sharing that. I love this idea of belief in choice that you keep ever before you, right? As you're typing or you're taking a sip of to your coffee, right? You know, it's, it's there in front of you all the time. And I, I think that that's really beautiful. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you for actually everything that you've shared. Where can we continue following you and learn a little bit more about you? Where do you hang out in the online space? Yeah, well, if, just very simply, if you go to Nathan Holritz, so N-A-T-H-A-N-H-O-L-R-I-T-Z.com, um, that is my personal site, but I link to kind of everything else that I'm doing from that site. So that's going to be the easiest place to go. You can find me on Facebook um, from there as well. And um, 
that's it. We'll keep it simple for the sake of minimalism, like we were talking about earlier. Yes, I like that simplicity, but you also mentioned your podcast. So go ahead and tell us where we can find more about that as well. Sure. Yeah. So um, I actually have a couple of podcasts. Um, one is called The Boca Podcast, uh, B O K E H podcast.com. It is geared toward wedding and portrait photographers, but the reality is that many, if not even most of the principles that we discuss there are, are actually highly relevant to any entrepreneur. Um, I've recorded over 300 episodes and almost three of, 300 of them are already out. So you can check that out, take advantage. There, there are, we have show notes. You've mentioned show notes. We have just a wealth of information in the show notes to go with those episodes as well. Um, the other one is called A Love Portrait. Now, this is a, a newer project um, that only has a few episodes, and um, it's one that I hope to put more time into in the future, but it is a relationship about, or I'm sorry, a podcast about how to create happy relationships. Hmm. Um, relationships and the psychology innate to relationships are quite fascinating to me, and I figured I'd sit down and have some conversations with, with people, um, romantic couples, certainly. Um, but explore other relationships as well, whether it's sibling relationships or you know with, with your parents or friends or otherwise, and understand what these people that come on this show have done to to create happy relationships. And so that's just a loveportrait.com. That's brilliant and such meaningful work. I will definitely check that out. I didn't realize you had that new project. Cool. Yeah. So very, very cool. Thank you again so much for everything that you shared. I know it's going to be super practical, very actionable for our listeners today. Thank you so much, Nathan, for being on. Oh, it's my privilege, truly. All right. That's it, guys. Be sure to tune in for the next Brittany Rossi show. We have more amazing guests lined up, so stay tuned. If you would like to find additional resources or workbooks that were mentioned in this podcast, just head on over to BrittanyRossi.com forward slash podcast, where you can find all the episode details and show notes.